Hi lovelies and welcome to The Witch's Cookery! A happy Ostara to you while we are celebrating the vernal equinox together! Welcoming spring with a colourful vlog including some delightful seasonal kitchen witchery, a foraging walk through the woods and other magical shenanigans, we shall look into the symbolism and meaning of Ostara and how you can apply it in your own life as a modern day witch and answer questions such as what should a witch most definitely plant near their door in order to repel evil and attract abundance. But before I get into all of that fun, I want to give you a little Easter basket filled with witchiness. I started a big Ostara sale on my website with a bunch of seasonal magic courses. There's also one about Ostara, online group workshops and of course my highly requested witchcraft retreats. From now until Easter many of them are now available at a very reduced rate. There's limited spots for most of the items so be quick. But if you want to witch it up with me in person, find like-minded people, start or step up your witchcraft game, now is your chance to do so. Link is in the description box below. But let's start this day off with a beautiful walk through nature and let's see if spring truly has sprung. When we look at Ostara and the other holidays on the wheel of the year as they are celebrated by much of the witchcraft community, they all have secular or religious counterparts in different cultures and countries. And while they might, depending on what angle you are coming from, have a deeper spiritual or ritualistic meaning tied to said culture or religion, the symbolism of the celebrations do often revolve around themes that we visually see back in nature and the season. Life cycles, growth cycles, the sun, the moon, the stars, winter and summer, darkness and light. Ostara celebrates the arrival of spring the rebirth or resurrection of the earth after its death in winter, the new start to fertile life and growth. While witchcraft in itself is not a religion, the observation of nature and giving it a deeper meaning is definitely a form of spirituality. What type exactly is defined by your personal beliefs? My personal belief is that we are all part of nature. And so it is our duty to learn about it, to be able to best honor and protect it, and to live with nature and its natural influence on us to feel fulfilled, happy and healthy. With the pace and setup of modern life, we often get removed from our roots, estranged to natural cycles and many don't even know anymore what nature can provide in comfort, healing and education. So as a witch in my personal practice, my way always leads outside along the gardens of my little town, over the fields and into the woods, to experience and witness changes in season with all my senses, gathering what is provided for crafting decor and food and meditating on keywords of the season and how they apply to my own life. For example, how can I renew myself in spring or what is reborn in my own life right now? And you just saw the star of today's masterpiece of finest spring kitchen witchery. The violet gracing the space underneath my apple trees with their fragrant sweet blossoms and spreading out like a delicate carpet of purple delight. When I see or rather smell them appearing, spring has most definitely sprung for me and I get so motivated to witch things up in the kitchen. In previous videos you had seen violet tea, magical purple syrup and violet infused sugar and today we are making something that is linked to some of the key themes of Astara. Sweet snakes filled with a Victorian style violet custard. Well, originally I just called them pudding buns but you know I needed something to tie it in with the meaning of the day and I know you are here to learn a thing or two about history so let's get into it. Get out your kitchen witch ones, put on those aprons and roll up your sleeves as we are diving straight into the flour. I would say this recipe is suitable for the baker with a bit of experience but can very easily be made beginner friendly by swapping the homemade custard for store-bought pudding or custard powder. And yes, you can also make this if you don't have violets available. They are only a fancy schmancy seasonal addition but this creation will taste just as delightful at a spring picnic or with your morning coffee without this floral addition. As always you can find the recipe in the description box below and can follow the baking and cooking steps in the video. We are starting off with a simple fresh yeast dough. 
Not much fetchery about that, unless you make it that. You simply mix all ingredients needed, making sure that the yeast gets a lovely warm bath, but not too hot, in the milk and melted butter, and feed it something sweet like sugar, syrup or honey. All you then have to do is knead the dough until you have a compact ball, drop it in a bowl, and then we cover it with a tea towel and let it rest. And while it is doing its thing, I can tell you a bit more about snakes, eggs and the spirit of Ostara. While milk is center stage in every Imbol kitchen witchery, Ostara is all about eggs. As a holiday that puts its emphasis on fertility and new life, this is probably not surprising. Another reason for this was of course that one of the signs that spring had returned was that birds and chickens would start laying eggs again. Nowadays we are used to hybrid chicken eggs from the supermarket available all year round, but for our ancestors eggs were scarce during the winter months. Hens need sunlight and the vitamin D it provides to produce eggshells, so back then, when the hens began laying plentifully again, spring had really returned. An egg is first born when it's laid and then again when it hatches. And while we tend to associate eggs with birds, remember that eggs are also laid by snakes. By shedding the old skin, snakes symbolize regeneration and transformation as well, making them a popular symbol of the holiday. Unfortunately, this hasn't translated into more religious celebrations of the holiday, as I yet have to see a chocolate snake on supermarket shelves alongside the eggs and bunnies. But for now, we will do with our custard snake then. When you want to know more about animals associated with Ostara, I recommend my Ostara email course on the website, as I said, link in the description box. In the meantime, we have made our wonderful violet custard by infusing warm milk with the fresh violets and then cooking it up, adding sugar, vanilla extract and some starch. And once that had thickened, we slowly brought egg yolks to temperature by carefully and slowly drizzling and stirring some of the hot milk mixture into it. When it was roughly at the same temperature as the remaining milk in the pot, just do the finger test, no need for thermometers, we poured it back in the pot and then stirred it until it thickened into the best custard ever, over low heat. If you fancy some extra taste intensity, add some fat in form of butter or ghee, I never know how to say that, right? You know what I mean, that Indian clarified butter thingy. You can let it set a bit more by covering it up with beeswax sheets or cling foil and setting it aside until you have rolled out your now risen dough. When we roll out dough, we are doing ourselves a favor if we dust the working surface or baking sheet as well as the rolling pin with a bit of flour so the dough doesn't stick to literally every part it touches. When we have a satisfying rectangle, the custard is thinly spread on top and then we roll it up. And here is where the baking sheet comes in handy as it allows you to roll it more evenly. Last but not least, cut the roll into individual swirls or snakes about as thick as a thumb, grease up a cake pan and then lay them into there. They will still grow quite a bit, so don't stuff them too tight. And ready is your burrow of edible snakes. I would suggest covering this up for another 30 minutes, leaving it to do some growing in a warm spot and then popping it in the oven for about 30 minutes or until golden brown at 170 degrees Celsius. If you have a sweet tooth, Mix up a glaze made from milk, water or lemon juice, mixed with some powdered sugar. When using milk or water, you can of course do the violet infusion trick again. Drizzle it over the snake's burrow, straight out of the oven. Let it cool until you dare to touch it without scorching your paws and devour those custard buns instantly. <gasps> so soft, so good! Just bags to be put on a festive Ostara breakfast table, don't you think? One of the loveliest signs of spring for me are definitely the flowers that pop up everywhere and the grass, the buds on the trees and bushes, the sweet scented air from the very first blossoms that start to open up. And now that most harsh frosts are hopefully over, we can start to slowly venture out in the garden again, get our hands dirty, dig in the soil and live our best green witch life. And if you don't have a witchy garden yet, now might be the time to start it. When planning your magical garden, 
and there are so many styles and ideas and creative and magical approaches to consider. So let's get a little bit into that, shall we? First of all, let's start with the logistics. Obviously, you don't need a huge garden space or a garden at all to have your own witchy little planting. All you really need is maybe a flower box that you can put on a windowsill or that you can have on a balcony. You could also consider doing a little indoor greenhouse or use grow lights. Or should you have a physical garden, you can dedicate an area of it to your magic practice. First ideas are for the hands-on practical witches. My green witches, my kitchen witches. If you really enjoy making tinctures, making tonics, making teas, I suggest looking into healing herbs. Herbs that you can actually use for their medicinal benefit and there's a ton of lore found in those plants if you buy yourself a really good guide you will also find a lot of folk belief and what we title folk witchcraft i as a kitchen witch have most of my balcony garden dedicated to edible herbs and plants edible flowers which you can shush up tarts that you serve at a garden picnic and the herbs that i typically use in my kitchen to bake to cook to spice things up as a folk witch you might want to consider the plants that are very tight into your local lore. The plants that protect your house, that are often used in spellcraft of your area, you can learn a great deal about the area that you live in by studying the plants and their history. If you fancy yourself a little Tom Bombadil or the female version thereof, how is she called? Goldie? Gold. Goldilocks. Not it. It's definitely not it. Look into creating an insect friendly garden so all the bees and pollinators can come and make the blossoms bloom. These are often gardens that are very rich in scent as well as in color. If in your magical practice you're more focused on banishing, protection, spells and rituals around that, I recommend looking into a poison garden or a nightshade garden. Every land that kind of like repels a lot of thorny plants. I saw that idea on Ella Harrison's Instagram Instagram, so if that kind of sounds intriguing, check that out for sure. But it doesn't always have to be super practical. You can also consider working with energies when you plant your witchy garden or your witchy balcony box. Maybe you're really drawn to a certain color. If you're into the aesthetic of things and want to make your house look all super cool and magical, what I saw someone do is plant all black varieties of plants and flowers, which looks super cool. Not something that you see every day. If you love to go out on summer nights and be under the moonlight how about planting a moon garden which basically consists of plants that bloom in the night or that have a lot of like white and very bright tinted blossoms that when the moonlight shines on them will have this like silvery bluish type of light that look very different and very magical. You can also make a growing altar space in your garden, planting flower herbs or whatever else your heart desires, considering the different elements that you have or that you work with in your practice. Or sort different areas of your garden for certain energies that can be reflected in the colors you plant there. For example, you could do a little chakra garden if you wanted to, or in the medicinal or magical correspondences that each of the plants hold. On my list today is to get to the nursery and to get some more happy colored flowers just for decoration so I can make the entrance of my house a little bit more inviting and spread some of that spring energy and happiness for the people that walk past. And while I do so, I would like to share some more folk witch knowledge with you on what greenery you as a witch would want to plant or keep next to your home. Especially the Celtic and Germanic tribes shared animistic beliefs about plants and trees, which they considered the dwelling space of gods and goddesses, spirits and souls. Another belief, popular until Victorian times and still utilized to some degree in the popular witchcraft sphere, was that plants possessed certain magical properties or strengths. What exactly those properties were was mostly derived from their color, the shape of blossoms or leaves, the growth conditions and so on. Something that we now title sympathetic magic. Based on these folk beliefs that found their way into old medicine and traditions around home and garden, we now know of an array of greenery that was used in or around the house to attract abundance and health and repel evil and sickness. Let's get started with a lovely spring flower. The primrose, which is in many European countries one of the first harbingers of spring, holds a special place in Irish folk belief. 
where it is closely connected with the Fey Folk. Ancient Celtic wisdom associates seeing a large patch of primroses with a gateway or portal into the fairy realm. Another old superstition claimed if you ate the blossom of a primrose you would see a fairy. And here we can see an overlap to German folk belief where the cowslip primrose is called Himmelschlüssel or Schlüsselblume, meaning quite literally flower of the key to heaven, so to another realm. Primroses placed on a doorstep were said to encourage the fairies to bless the house and all who lived there. Primroses scattered on the doorstep supposedly protected the butter from thieving fairies. During medieval times, primroses were considered to have magical properties. The plant was believed to have the power to dispel negative energy, promote good luck and attract prosperity. Regardless if you now believe in the existence of fairies who want to call in good energies for your home or just like some delicate bright yellow flowers near your home, primroses in all its variations might be the way to go. Now, there is not only flowers, but also common kitchen herbs that have a long-standing tradition and folk witchery. You might know the famous quote from Practical Magic, always throw salt over your left shoulder, keep a rosemary by your garden gate, plant lavender for luck and fall in love whenever you can. Not only does rosemary have about a thousand uses in the magical as well as in the mundane, it was also a plant that was considered important to keep next to your home. In medieval times, it was believed to not only ward off bad dreams, it was seen as equally effective as vanishing all evil from the house when grown in the garden. Fun tidbit, a house where rosemary flourished was seen as being ruled by the woman of the household. But there is also a very mundane reason to plant rosemary at the garden gate. It has a very strong aroma that can either confuse pests or completely deter them from eating other plants in your garden. Last but not least, let's consider shrubs and trees if your space allows for that. In my region, a lot of the trees are not only called by the name, but will have a female prefix. This still strongly hints to the animistic beliefs of our ancestors. The elder tree is sometimes called Holle or Hollerbusch, like the goddess Holder, while the hazel tree is referred to as Frau Hasel, Mrs. Hazel. An elder tree on your property that is flourishing means good health and luck for the household. Unsurprising seeing the many medicinal and culinary uses we get from berries and blossoms. Being the dwelling place of the most important goddess in the pantheon that ruled over home, hearth, children and family, it was to be kept in good condition and to this day it is not custom to cut an elder tree down. The hazel tree next to providing nuts in autumn also has a wide use in magical practice. Having it near your home was believed to protect you from fire and lightning. The branches were used for their assigned magical properties and, for example, crafted into wishing rods. But not to overcomplicate things, when planting a fun window box full of spring flowers, you can simply go with some color magic and see what you want to draw into your home. I hope you have the most beautiful Ostara, a balanced vernal equinox and an awesome energizing spring. <sighs> With not too many seasonal allergies. <laughs> See you soon! <laughs>